The Buddha Dhamma is really the teaching leading to Dhamma. The teaching of the Buddha, which leads one to get to Dhamma. Most people tend to think of the Buddhist teaching as being either a philosophy or a, or a religion or something of that sort. But it's not, it's just a method. And because it's a method, you, you mustn't look for the absolute truth in it. It's not there. Absolute truth is something you can't talk about. You can't use words for it. And the, the Buddha Dhamma has been made up as a skillful method for most human beings to enable them to change themselves and develop themselves until they get to the point where they can, let's say, get to Nibbana, see the truth, get to the Dhamma. And this is the way that you, you, one's just got to train oneself, and then one comes to see for oneself. If one tries to know what Dhamma is and what Nibbana is, without getting there, you'll get some concepts and ideas, but it won't be the real thing at all. It'll just be ideas and symbols in your own mind. That's all. To actually know for yourselves, you have to get there at least once. And more if you can do it. It seems that the stages of Sotapana and the rest are stages where Nibbana has been, let's say, seized. It's, it's not really seized, but been experienced, let's say. And coming away from that, I'd, I'd say you can't remember anything of it, because there's nothing there to remember. You can only remember things that are, are relative. And this isn't. Coming away from that, uh, you don't you don't know what actually happened. All you know, there's been a change. Now this is this is the way of it when when nibbana is seen because it's seen though uh, the truth is known. The aftertaste of that is there. The aftertaste means that you have complete faith in it. In a complete faith, you, 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 you don't doubt the Dhamma at all, um, because you've seen it. You know that's the way. So, so doubt step just can't arise. You also know that this body, this mind and so on, this is not oneself. Because one's seen it, you see what it is. And one, one knows that other methods and the way they have of trying to get to uh, the, the ultimate, if they're the same sort of things like going to church and all that sort of thing, you know perfectly well, all that's useless. It's not the way at all. At most they can be sort of uh, mild aids, like a band-aid. And this, is, this is the thing, this is the way it works. Because once you've seen these things, it's, it's kind of known in you, but it's known deeply, not known on the surface, not known by something you can sort of think about. You can't think about because everything you think about is relative. It's always dual, always me thinking about that. You get something that's not dual, well, what can you say? There's nothing you can pin it down with. Means by tamata. Tamata, I mean, that thing Thai means normal. When, I'm not sure, is it Thai or Pali? I can't remember that. Just tamata. That tamata means normal. Uh, and as uh, normal, it's, it's the, it is the sort of the ordinary way of Dhamma. Because the Buddha said that his, his, uh, his teaching was obeyed. It wasn't sort of exciting. It wasn't something that uh, was sort of explosive. It was something that led one to a, to a normality. And the thing to remember though is that Nibbana, whatever it is, must be there all the time. It isn't something that can arise and die away. Because of that, if one can attain Nibbana, 
and the Buddha says we can, it must be in one all the time. That must be there. It isn't something that can, can arise in you. Because anything that arises in you must cease. All things that arise cease. So, it's obvious from that that, that Nibbana is there all the time. The only thing is it's covered up. It's covered up by a lot of shit, actually. And that's speculation. And our job is to peel off that up, to scrub it off. If we do that, that's all we need to do. It's not easy. <laughs> it's not a little bit too. Quite a lot. Um, you say that when one experiences Nibbana, um, one tries to, um, one doesn't really know that they've actually truly been there because uh, you said it was all relative. But there's also sort of a vanga where, where you can go into this like dead space as well. And when you come out of the vanga, it seems um, the experience could be relative and mistaken for nirvana. How does one know the difference between the two? The difference between the two is quite clear by the results. Take the results, what it does. A person who goes through any of the past moments must know a big change has taken place. And the big change doesn't die away. Remain. Boanga uh, is just a burbling on of the mind underneath. And that's exactly where our child is. And we child located there. That's his home. And that's where you've got to deal with it. When the, when the final time comes, when you come to, to uh, uh, getting free. And it seems that in Boanga, you've got the chitta going on and on and on. And it's linking together, moment from moment to moment, it's linking. And it, you get a continuity there. So you get the continuity of self, so the apparent continuity of self. Uh, now, it seems that when the person becomes arahant, that's broken up. Continuity is broken up. Because the continuity is broken up, that person is in the present all the time. So the chitter is in the present. Uh, it's not really the person, because the person involves the body and mind, and those are just relative things. But it's the chitta which is, is, has gone completely quiescent and, and still. You, you can, like I say, it's absorbed into Nibbāna. And the distinction between that and Nibbāna is how you can't make. There's no distinction. Is knowing the Is? Knowing. Knowing is a, is a characteristic of, of the Chitta, yes. There is knowing. There is always knowing. But the knowing is not necessarily uh, reflective or conscious. But it's always there. The person with Alzheimer's uh, for example, all you know Alzheimer's disease, the, where the brain goes into por like porridge, and uh, the uh, memory just all goes. The person with that has got no idea what to do, where he is, uh, what his situation is. Uh, it all goes because memory is gone. So there's knowing there. Knowing is always there. But the knowing is, is just bare knowing, that's all. You can't do anything. That's why the, the body and mind are necessary, because the body and mind are like a computer. They're the hardware and the software, the body and the mind. And 
the person using that computer can only use it when the computer is there. Uh, the person using it is like the chitter. And the, the chitter of that person will use the computer in whatever way they want to, for good or for bad or whatever it is. And the computer just follows. In the same way, in, in the, uh, with the chitta within us, when the, when the chitta, under the influence of the kilesas, wants to go this way or wants to go that way, it, it makes the body go like that, body and mind. And the body and mind then just follow. And they do the bidding of the chitta. And because of that, the body and mind are not really essential. The essential thing is the chitta. But in order to get free, we have to have the body and mind, you see, as a mechanism necessary to break the kilesas. Because the kilesas are not in the body and mind, they're in the chitta. <coughs> and this is, this is the difficulty. Because they're in the chitta there, when the body and mind dies, the kilesas are still there, they haven't gone. Or the results of the kilesas and the tendency for them to arise. Uh, and they do arise, they arise as the Sankaras and the Sita Sankara. And because they're there, there's the next birth. And then you see the mass again. And there's no longer body and mind picked up by the jitta, just knowing continues. Knowing continues there. A minute ago you said it might be unconscious? It's not, not not so much unconscious as uh, unaware. You say consciousness can be there uh, in the sense of the chitta, chitta being conscious. But the thing is, it's not the thing. You can't can't refer to anything. It's got no reference at all. When it's got no reference. You just can't do anything. It's stuck. I mean, you can make the distinction. If that chitta grasps at the body of a dog, then it's got a body, it's got a mind, and it has the chitta as well, in the same way as we have. But it's only got the faculties of a dog, because the body and mind are different. So the body and mind are like a computer, it depends on how good the computer is. And if the computer is good and the software is good, then, then you can do a lot with it. But if they're poor, you can't do much. And the thing that enables you to have better software and better hardware is, of course, the sila dhamma and the training in the mind. Training itself. To do things which, which are crucial. And that all the time tends to promote it and make it get better and more powerful. The akusala is just going back into the mud again. I had some question about my meditation practice. Last two nights I had some problem with force, some force come and pressure from my body and I cannot move. I, I, I am, say, my uh, paralyzed. Uh, so you mean when I can stop meditation or, or, or can I... It's not, not necessary. Force. And then voice is some voice. Mm. Void. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Mm. Void. 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 Sound. Resonating. The most likely cause of this is yourself. Your own chelation. And your own kamma. This is the most likely cause. I won't say that there aren't other causes, but other possible causes. But in 90% it comes from oneself and it's one's kamma that's the trouble. The thing that has the most influence over one is one's own kamma from the past. And this can come up in all sorts of ways and it is quite extraordinary what it can produce. I mean, I don't know if you've read any of the accounts of 
psychologists and the things that the people who, who get mental trouble, what they can see sometimes and what, what happens. And the, the things that are happening are 90% are from oneself. There are cases where other entities can come and influence one, but they're rare, and most of them are not very powerful. Generally, it's, it's pretty safe to assume when anything of that sort happens, this is part of oneself, one's own karma. And the, the thing is, you have to counter it somehow, and, and sort of live with it and kind of deal with it. And when, when this sort of pressure comes on you, is this when you're asleep, or when you're doing a meditation, or...? No, by sleep. By sleep. By sleep, is it? Uh, yeah, that can then, yes, yes, yes. This is quite often the case. The, the thing is to find out how, how to deal with that. One possible thing is to not go to sleep until you're, you're, you feel your mind's cleared with meditation practice. To watch your thoughts very carefully before. Because if they go bad, that can very easily influence you. Generally to be very careful of morality. Morality in Buddhism only concerns speech and action. In other words, it's, it's our relationship with the world. It doesn't concern thought. Although thought is very important. The thought technically comes under the category of musamadi, not, not, not sila. And the thing is to learn how to, how to get oneself under control if one can. Another thing you might try doing also is, before you sleep, do some chanting. Some of the, some of the chants and learn them and go through them. That can help, because they set the mind right. But unless you have very good evidence, best not to assume that it comes from outside. There are endless people in this world who think that somebody else is doing something to them. And that turns into paranoia quite easily. It's, it's usually quite false. The other thing one can do is to remind oneself that when you get trouble like that, this must be something I've done in the past. Even if the trouble comes from outside, one must be open to that, which is because of what one's done in the past. So the thing is to avoid thinking, one must at all costs avoid blaming other people. This is important. If that's one's way, one has to go that way. There's no other way for one. There's no other way for one because that is one's karma. And one's, one's built it up oneself in the past. Because of that, that it determines the way you have to go now to get free. I, I knew a, a doctor once. He's, he's a good man, but he was very dull. And he told me that when he was a medical student, he wasn't dull like that. Uh, he'd been quite bright. But he said he, he'd done a lot of work on medicine and so on. He'd, he'd gone through the, the course and, so, and all the rest of it. He said one day it just changed and he became dull. Now, the way I read this is that his primary characteristic was dosa. Hate. Hate character. And that hate is unpleasant. It brings dukkha. Now, when the, when the mind was sharp like that, combined with the dukkha, with the dosa, uh, the kilesas would come up and just clamp down. This can happen with some people. And then they get they go dull. They don't have the dukkha, they don't have the... not the same dukkha. They don't have the sharpness of mind and they want to get free, they want to get out of it. But it's as though they're in a fog and they can't. A lot of people get like that. If a person like that pushes it and tries to get out, what will happen is they come back to the dosa again. When they do get out, if they do, they'll find a lot of dosa comes up. A lot of hate comes up in them, just automatically. 
and they've got to go through that and deal with the hate then and this is hard work this is a hard, a hard way but that sort of person is the only way for them but getting into a state of delusion is not good very difficult in the old days it used to be mainly the villagers from the first sort of villages and that's where people came from, most of them and they had a lot of faith they were not always terribly clever but they were quite hard working and they could put up with difficulties and then they went off to the forest and if they had a good teacher uh, he probably gave them hell but they developed they developed well and because of that you've got to, people like the many followers of Tanishan Man but nowadays people come mostly from the cities and they they be to universities and like that and this if anything is a big disadvantage I'd say it's, it, it has some advantages but for the, for the way of Dhamma it isn't awfully helpful mainly because when one has an education one gets the impression one knows and really one doesn't one's learnt things, one's thought about them but one hasn't got the, the experience that's necessary to know properly and because of that the, the standard of meditation mostly nowadays isn't very high I'd say there are some people who it's very good in but not many and even the, the ones who seem to have quite an ability at Samadhi for instance from what I've seen most of them go wrong they get a what and then they go out searching for money to make a what and they, they get plenty of donors and, and their whole interest is in developing the what instead of doing the practice like they should they, they, they make a name for themselves and that, that's finished then once you remember the parable of the log where the Buddha saw a log floating down the Ganges and he said if that log doesn't get stuck on a sandbank if it doesn't go rotten and sink uh, if it's not taken by people or, or the, the gods or somebody like that for use and I can't remember all the things but things like that if it can get through all that it will go to the ocean the only thing to do is practice and more practice at the meditation and at mindfulness those two the two go together of course but the mindfulness is very very important this is the key key to the whole thing because when you're mindful your mind is, is where you are and it's, it's on the things that are there that sees them one sees them and because one's mindful and takes note when you take note you've then got the data for wisdom to work on without the mindfulness wisdom hasn't got much hope So no, the mindfulness is absolutely essential and I would say try to be mindful in everything and you'll find that that is, that is the way to do it and also don't worry too much if other people say you're doing too much practice or you should be doing this, you should be doing that when you're doing the practice to some extent when you're in a watch you've got to conform to the what and the, this, what the what's doing but at other times I, I would say try and keep the meditation going as much as you can otherwise what happens is tend to get diverted into other things building, repairing, writing 
translating all sorts of things and while all these things are, are good things to do they're not directly the way and I would say that it isn't very much use trying to do the practice when you're doing these things until you've got mindfulness if your mindfulness is strong enough you can do it, okay but not many people can do that, not many people have got enough mindfulness and the mindfulness is the thing that's necessary there because if you can do your building or, or uh, repairing or anything, really be mindful it's alright, you can use that as a meditation practice but if you do it in the ordinary way, it's just ordinary work, that's all I've also got to get an idea of the contrast between the world and Dhamma and the world and Nibbana, if you can think about that <laughs> I mean you can only do it as a concept try and think what the world's really like you think of what's happening in the world and you think you might be reborn in Ru Rwanda or in, in uh, Yugoslavia or I don't know where the trouble spots are now, probably Israel's one of them at the moment <laughs> but there's, there's, there's plenty of places where you can be reborn China as well you haven't got much hope there and if you think like that, and you think well I better work hard now I better make sure that what I'm doing is going to put me in good state if I, if I can't get there this time at least I'll be in a good state the next time if you think like this and think about the world and what it is what its nature is you'll see that it's a pretty messy place and there's plenty of dukkha there and uh, we here, we're pretty fortunate I mean, if you want to see people who are not fortunate, go to India or to China you see plenty there who, who, who are really bad state and we don't know what our own Kamala is so the, the thing is we've got to see how necessary it is to work and this can spur one on to some extent you, it won't happen if you do it once but if you think about this quite often it will, it will have an effect you, you'll, you'll think you've got to get on Yeah, that, that can be a cause, seeing what the future may be and to realize how bad it can get There was a book brought out about the Thirty Years' War in Europe and that, that shows how bad it can get what it was like in Germany at that time It wasn't Germany then, there wasn't any Germany it was a lot of little states, but uh, we call it Germany now but uh, that, that book, it was by one of the Huxleys and it's quite, quite, quite an eye-opener I didn't know about it before until I'd read it and it showed up the Thirty Years' War in Europe but you've got comparable things happening in Africa now in the Congo and places like that, I mean it's just armies going back and forward and living off the land, living off the people and just chaos force <laughs> tradition for educated people I think all of us here are kind of a more modern educated people and mm. so what would you say is the difference to the way that we should practice and then practice will work for us which is maybe different from what was working for the previous generation. One, of the, one of the important things of course is following on the last, last question um, we know the world 
we know what it's like, we can see it. We, because we, we've learnt about the world and we've, we've uh, all been in touch with the media of communication and we ourselves have probably lived in, in it, we've seen it, and we know what the world is like. Many people who are just villagers and so on, they don't know. All they know is their local environment. And that's okay, it's very good if, they, if the environment's reasonable for them. But we know the world, and we know what it can be like. And this can, can help to spur us on to have right effort. This is quite a, quite a good thing that we can do. The other thing we must do is to use wisdom to try and understand the teaching. If, if, you, if you've got wisdom, you must use it. And you use it by thinking. By thinking, analyzing, looking, searching. This is the way. The, the practice of calm is to put the mind into the right state for deep wisdom. For example, if you can get to a deep samadhi, then you've got a very firm and good basis for wisdom, the, the real wisdom, the Bhavanamaya Panya, to develop. But uh, also if you have the, have the wisdom to, to develop just in the ways of ordinary thinking and so on, you can learn about the Dhamma and think about it. And when you learn about the Dhamma, it's no good just taking it what the books, the books say. You've got to turn that into personal experience. In other words, if you, if you see something in, in the books that says something like this, whatever it is, then you've got to look and you think, how does this apply to me? Where have I seen this in my life? Uh, and one's got to try and find out what the real meaning is by doing that. The books of the Tripitaka are in many ways rather obscure. And they're, they're written in a sort of um, theological style. And because of that, unless you know Pali very well that is, because of that, it's, it's difficult to make them really personal. And one's got to see through a lot of what's in there. And there's also things in there which, until one has developed an understanding of Dhamma, one can't see. One can only see them and realize some of the subtleties that are there when, when, when one has developed them or someone. This comes from one's changing view. Because as one develops, as one thinks, and investigates, and tries to find out how the world works and how, how we work as well, oneself. When one does that a lot, then one's view, one's view changes. It changes because when we started off, our minds were 90% out in the world. We, we have a very good knowledge of the world. In the West they know all sorts of things. They know all about the world. But they don't know anything about themselves. And what we've got to do is to learn how to look at oneself and get to know oneself. And if one can do that, if one gets to know oneself, one will see where one's view of the world is all wrong. Because most people, their view is all wrong. It's all wrong because they have karma and they have stuff which they picked up when they were very small. When they're the young child, it learns things, learns all the time. And it picks up things that, that it can, it picks up whatever it can. And it's in no position to criticize or to analyze and think is this right or is this wrong. So it just accepts. And it accepts what everyone says. And because it accepts what everyone says, and it's absolutely open territory inside the young child, the whole lot sticks very deep. And we've still got most of that there. In fact, we can say the young child is still there. How old he got to, I don't know, but he, he's there in, mo in most of us. And we've got to look at that. 
Look at those views and see, are they true? And we can only do it gradually uh, as, as one develops. But one must look and one must be very careful about hidden assumptions in our views. If you have a view of how things work, of, of anything, it doesn't matter what it is, that's okay, but, but uh, one must be ready to chuck it out if you find the evidence shows it to be wrong. If you do that, you can develop. The one thing that's, that's almost more of a blockage to development than anything else is a rigid view. Rigid view, rigid ideas, unchangingness, that, that prevents development entirely. I mean, you can see what the, the belief in God that some people have and what an effect it has on them. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying that a belief in God can't be useful, it might be. But some people and the concept they have of God and what they, what they take it to mean, it's very peculiar. But they hold on to it really tight. Wrong view is a very bad thing, when it's held on to anyway. If you hold loosely to views, it doesn't matter.